Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Uh, today I want to talk to you about something kind of interesting. Uh, the role of Hollywood in jazz. And jazz shows up in films, of course. And a lot of the great jazz stars even uh, perform in films. From Duke Ellington to Louis Armstrong, this was a pretty common thing. Uh, Some Like It Hot. One of my favorite films from that era is, of course, The Sweet Smell of Success, which is a fantastic jazz film uh, with Chico Hamilton and just a great soundtrack and a, one of the best films of the era, too. Every, every time I mention Sweet Smell of Success, it's, it makes me smile. It's so grim in its outlook on honesty and uh, people in America in, in the mid-50s. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty honest look at uh, the, the American lifestyle and uh, the dishonesty that most of us uh, interact in the world with every day. But a uh, great film, great soundtrack. But we're not really looking at that aspect of it. We're looking more at uh, the big film companies and how they started to impact the record industry. And first and foremost, you have MGM. Metro, Metro Goldwyn Meyer, and uh, they do. A, they they start a label, probably as late as the late forties, or as early as the late forties. So I think there's seventy eight stuff. I know there's a lot of ten inch MGM jazz, and it's fairly safe. You know, I mean West Coast. Uh, they do some black artists, but it's uh, carefully packaged. I'll pull a few pieces for you guys to see. While the bulk of MGM titles in this era were the white Woody Herman type artists, there was some interesting stuff, and a few things are even pretty important to have. This is some Teddy Wilson, who Benny Goodman brought to fame in the late 30s. And so by the 10-inch era, I mean, early 50s, he's kind of a safe territory for these labels to... Uh, play and to produce and put records out by. Notice there's not a photograph on the man, and I doubt there was in the back either, but uh, I mean, very uh, very rarely do these big labels put black men on the covers of their own records. Uh, there's a fun Lionel Hampton record, a uh, little 10 inch, and Lionel is just truly one of the great virtuosos and players, personalities and band leaders of the jazz era and when you go through so many of the guys bios and discographies and who they are and where they came from Lionel Hampton was one of the great teaching universities where young black jazz men got their got to cut their teeth you know you have Ellington and Basie and they're even and those guys continue to be those those colleges into the 70s and 80s to be honest and you have Blakey with his hard bop you know crew of guys that are pretty impressive but there's a middle era going through the war and bebop and into, you know, the early days of postmodern uh, jazz, post-bop jazz. And it's guys like Dizzy Gillespie and Lionel Hampton and even Earl Father Hines that have these big bands that are really bringing in a lot of young, exciting talent. And a lot of cats really cut their teeth with some really great legends like Lionel Hampton. Uh, I was actually going through one of Dizzy Gillespie's Verve sessions or jazz recital, I think it was. And first, I was blown away by the trombone. And once again, a trombone player blew me away. I don't know why I have to even think about who it would be anymore. It always turns out to be Jimmy Cleveland. He's just so fucking good. He's just such a dynamic. I had a trombone player come in yesterday, and uh, he plays in John Seaver's some kind of band, jazz band in Rochester, 20 minutes that way. And uh, I've heard about them from several people. And I think it was probably the first band I've ever met. Not positive on that. But uh, he was pretty well versed in jazz trombone players, thankfully. Unlike a few of the guys who have come in. But uh, he didn't know Jimmy Cleveland, which is no big shock. Jimmy Cleveland's name doesn't ring like it should. It's very under the surface. He only has three or four leaders, albums of the leader. Which I actually have them pulled up, so I'm going to show them to you. So Cleveland, again, he's just a phenomenal player. This is his first record as a leader on MRC 36066. Uh, 
just incredible. And the band members on here read as follows. Cecil Payne, baritone. Lucky Thompson, tenor. Ernie Royal on the trumpet. Barry Galbraith on the guitar. Hank Jones on the piano. Paul Chambers on the bass. O.C. Johnson or Max Roach on the drums. Insane. And, I mean, from the opening track, he could tell that I knew what I was talking about. That this guy was a bad motherfucker. And Jimmy Cleveland chops it up. Uh, his second record for Emerson, I believe, was this one. 36, no, it's probably this one. Yeah, 36, 1, 2, 6, so probably a good year later. And this one has a great band as well, uh, with Art Farmer, Benny Golson, Winton Kelly, uh, Charlie Person, Eddie Jones, and then Don Butterfield on the tuba. There's also a Jay McAllister on a couple songs on the tuba. They switch off. But just bigger ensembles, but just well orchestrated. And uh, the virtuosity of Cleveland is always on point. He just blows you away. Uh, we also played that fantastic... Uh, Melba, Liston, uh, the Bones Out record on, on MGM, actually, Metro on the on the Metro Jazz label, which is one of the little side labels with 15 records on it, great little label. Uh, and Cleveland was on that, along with Al Gray. And talking about hearing two distinct but wonderful bone players, there's like six or seven bone players total on that record. It's kind of a who's who of bone players in that era. And Melba's a bad, bad woman, to make no mistake about it. Uh, so Cleveland's third was 36153. Uh, a map of Cleveland, a map of Jimmy Cleveland, it says. And then uh, you have Ray Copeland on the trumpet, Ernie Royal on the fuglehorn, uh, Jerome Richardson's on the saxon flu, who's another guy just like Jimmy Cleveland, a virtuoso, shows up on thousands of records. And that's the thing about uh, Cleveland. He's only on four records as a leader. But when you look at his list of, of side work, it's pages long and it'll blow you away how many records he's on, how many artists he played with, and how, how don't I know about him? But, uh, again, Art Taylor's on this, Junior Mance is on this, insane stuff. Some of the best hard bop coming out of Emerson. And this is a session that didn't get released when it was supposed to. Ends up being 36-160, I think it is. Rhythm Crazy. It's got Hank Jones, Milt Hinton, Art Farmer, O.C. Johnson, Benny Golson, Jerome Richardson, and Jimmy Cleveland. So, again, just insanity. What a great player. and A uh, guy that's underappreciated today by a large mile. And I'd probably say that too much, but man, Cleveland was a, a star. And Melba was a bad, bad girl as well. I want to real quick mention here, because I think I forget to get back to it. Uh, that jazz recital record by Dizzy Gillespie I mentioned a minute ago has a fantastic young tenor man on it. It took me a while to figure out who it was. Turns out it was Hank Mobley. And at one point, it clicked with me that, oh, man, Mobley did play with Dizzy. And I was trying to figure out who it was. And uh, I went to my bio printout book I have that I made. And sure enough, that's Hank Mobley on that session, which was pretty cool, along with Jimmy Cleveland, who was blowing my socks off. You have a young Hank Mobley over there kind of being inspired by Jimmy Cleveland. It was pretty cool. I just wanted to add that in there, guys. Uh, back to MGM, Cats and Chicks, Clark Terry and Terry Pollard. Uh, Terry has a record, of course, at Bethlehem and uh, is a fantastic player of the Detroit School of Musicians. Uh, Beryl Booker also shows up on this. Uh, it looks like Terry's actually playing the vibes and Beryl's playing the piano. She's a fantastic pianist. And so it's uh, the Pollard group here is all female, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and a tough thing to do because, you know, I mean, someone gets pregnant or someone gets uh, a different job or quits to be a housewife, it's, t it's tougher to keep an all-girl band together because there's so many fewer players that are female that can really handle the stage. Uh, Clark Terry on the other side with Lucky Thompson, Herbie Green, Tal Farlow, Horace Silver, Kenny Clark, and Percy Heath. So the girls are up against it, but they hold their own. They really throw down. That's MGM. Again, uh, there's a lot of black talent here. But there's not any semblance of there being black musicians on that recording. And like I said, MGM does a little side label called uh, Metro Jazz. It's 15 records long. I'll do a little episode on that because it's such a cool streak of records that they put out. So MGM is doing some fine stuff, you know. Uh, and they go into the LP era and they have stuff by, I mean, some pretty big names, including some Billy Holiday stuff. But uh, MGM was just the beginning of the film industry kind of jumping at that opportunity. So here's a few other pieces that 
MGM does in the LP era. Uh, Sam Taylor, who's a Sam the Man Taylor, is a fantastic tenor player. Uh, Harlem Nocturne is just kind of one of the wonderful songs of the era. Uh, film Noir, if you like that melancholic minor key dark alleyway with a fire escape and a cat meow and just that whole you like shadowy stuff uh sam the man taylor is fantastic and he has about four or five tiles at mgm here in the early and the mid to late 50s that are pretty fantastic music for melancholy babies even the cover is outstanding uh if you like king curtis if you like uh some illinois jacket he's kind of in that same ballpark uh i mean i just love his work the covers are cool. They got a little cheesecake on them at times, which is fun. Uh, Prelude to the Blues. This one's like 57 or 58. You can tell the difference in the, in the print even on the cover there. There's a Billie Holiday record here on MGM. And uh, MGM actually owns Verve at this point, which is partly how that ends up there. Uh, Charlie Shavers, one of the great trumpet players of the swing era, the late swing era, into the early post-bop era. Shavers has a lot of Armstrong, some Roy Aldridge. He can really embody and play a lot of things. He's a pretty dynamic, very big, bright tone. Very sweet notes. He's, uh, again, a lot of Armstrong, but a lot of personality of his own. He's not the same character as Armstrong, but he's still very cheeky very uh very accomplished and his career is quite incredible but he's very forgotten today and again part of this he ends up on labels like mgm where he actually sold these records sold probably pretty well being on a major label like that and they put the black man right on the cover so good for them but these do come a little later probably 58 59 here maybe by this time maybe even 1960 great stuff so mgm does some cool stuff now let's look at the next label that kind of jumps into the mix here. I'll be right back. All right, so we changed locations here. We're over on the east wall of the building. This is the long set of cabinets here. Uh, again, thanks to my friend Ben for making these for me. They're such beautiful cabinets, and uh, I get a lot of comments on them when people walk in, which is pretty cool. Now we're going to talk about ABC Paramount. And they jump in the fray as the LPR kind of dawns. And boy, they do some great stuff. And for those of you who know, they're the ones behind eventually uh, the Impulse label, which comes around in late 1960 and the 60s and the 60s, and was one of the strong forces in jazz in the 60s. But ABC was the precursor to that, part of the Paramount Film Company, and one of the big film companies along with MGM and Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers shows up again in this mix here a little bit later. But what Paramount ABC brings is a wonderful mix of stuff. And there's some fantastic titles in here. Starting with that great Kenny Dorham record. I'm going to pause this and pull a few things out. So here's some of the real early ABC stuff. Smart Alec by Alec Templeton. A great piano player. Uh, again, fairly safe stuff for a big film company to release. Blues and Other Shades of Green by the great Irby Green. One of the great trombone players coming out of the swing era. A real provocative player. Bobby Scott. A fantastic young pianist who does stuff at uh, Bethlehem as well at this point. This is uh, number 102. The series starts at 100. Dave McKenna, solo piano, 104. Uh, 106 is Don Elliott, the fantastic... Um, again, a guy who plays at Bethlehem in, in the, the same era, who plays the, uh, what's it called, the mellophone as well as trumpet and vibraphones, and you get some stuff at Savoy playing the vibes. He also does some stuff at Bethlehem as a singer. Uh, Don Elliott's body of work is a very impressive, uh, diverse body of uh, jazz. So along with some fairly obscure stuff, Swinging on the Vibraries, Leonard Feather's West Coast Jazz Bands, a compilation, number 110. 117's Tom Stewart, Sextat Quintet, with some pretty fantastic players in there. Steve Lacey, Joe Puma, Herbie Mann, Dave McKenna, Whitey Mitchell, some of the who's who of the West, White Cats at that time. Uh, modern Dixieland, Dick Stratton, cool cover. Yeah, it's pretty obscure stuff at this point. Brother Matthew with Eddie Condon's jazz band. Uh, Jerry Jerome 
on the wild side. Looks like he's playing a bass clarinet there. Some pretty obscure stuff. Johnny Janis, a nice little guitar player. But in with that same mix of stuff is great stuff like number 109. Jimmy Rainey, the fantastic guitar guitarist who had worked with Stan Getz quite a lot. Great record. And this is actually the foremost guitars. And it has Chuck Wayne, Joe Puma, and Dick Garcia all on there as well. Uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, Lucky Thompson, number 111, featuring Oscar Pettiford. I mean, high pedigree stuff right there. That one might be licensed, though, from a European recording, if I recall. Billy Taylor shows up here early at ABC, does some great work. Uh, Kenny Dorham, probably the most landmark piece of the ABC era jazz. I can go for hundreds of bucks. The great Candido, bringing some of that Latin uh, Afro-Cuban sound to the mix. Whitey Mitchell, the brother of... Uh, Red Mitchell, the bass, they're both bass players. He shows up on a lot of stuff at this time. More Jimmy Rainey, this, but this time with the trombone is Bob Brookmeyer. Uh, Billy Taylor, again, at the London House. So you see ABC's doing some pretty cool stuff here. Oscar Pettiford and Hi-Fi. And Oscar Pettiford has a pretty cool band at this point with a lot of great talent, including guys like Gigi Grice. Irby Green, another record by him, number 37. Number 39 is Vinnie Burke. And there's about 170 titles or so prior to the Impulse launch. Maybe more like 200, actually. And I have a good deal of it, especially the real jazz names and titles in there. But even the stuff that's less known and kind of those filler titles, it's still incredible playing. That's what I've always kind of reminded people that you didn't get to make recordings in the 50s unless you could really play. They weren't going to waste tape on you and uh, studio time. It was You had to be a real player to get into those places even to be able to cut a record. And so all that stuff on these labels, is it's really good stuff, even if it's not something you recognize. And a lot of it can be had really cheap. So keep your eyes on some of that stuff on ABC. And of course they launched Impulse in 60, and that helps shape the jazz of that next era. So it's pretty clear to see that MGM does some fine work and there's some stuff worth looking for. And certainly ABC is a label that has some fine jazz from the mid to late 50s. And we're going to wrap this up today right here. And on the next episode, we're going to deal with part two, where we look at the other two labels that made quite an impact during the jazz age, in particular United Artists. And uh, Fox doesn't really, they're one of the big film studios, but they didn't really get in this mix of jazz at that time. By the time the 70s come along, they're making a lot of disco records, uh, Fox, uh, the Fox company. But like Barry White has some great titles on, on the Fox label. But, uh, for now, we're going to talk about these main four, and uh, we'll get back to you. We'll see you soon. Uh, stay tuned for part two coming up in the next few days. Thanks. Peace.